Hi, everyone. It's Emil. It's Emil Guillermo. Emil, I'm up to you. Wow. What happened yesterday? Darn Facebook. Welcome to our program. This is, we're here Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific live with what we call our micro talk show, right? Uh, the micro talk show, the micro talk show of the AAPI or the AAXs, a naming convention to include all of us. But you know, look, and I mean this, and this is for everyone. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same gong closet. We are. We, we really are. And uh, I know I'm looking at myself now because I, I was looking at a, a tape, reviewing the tape of the program yesterday. And I was saying, oh my God, I'm squinting. I'm looking like, a, like I'm a Mr. Magoo or something. Now, now I got to open my eyes. Okay, look, see, I, see, I have eyes. So here we are. We're here, like I said, at 2 p.m. Pacific Live, and you're looking at your watch. You say, Emil, it's only 1, 152. You got eight minutes. Take eight, as they say. But no, no. This is the Lanyap section. We're, we're delivering. We're delivering that something extra. Because we call this, what What does an Asian American think? I'm the aforementioned Asian American. What do we think? We're, today we're going to talk about the Morabe Powerball. That's significant. That's significant. We'll talk about that straight up at 2 o'clock. We're going to talk about Facebook, of course. I mean, everyone's still buzzing about it. Like, what the heck happened? Filipino-American history. I mean, this is the month. Got to talk about it today. We're going to do our news scan, be meditative, talk sports. Did you see the Warriors last night? I was watching that game. I said, oh, this is like some mid-season form team from like a couple of years ago. And I said, no, that, that's these Warriors. That's the new. If you're a Warrior fan, get excited. I, I think they're coming back in, in, a, in a big way. And then, of course, the Giants and, oh, if we must talk about the Raiders, they're not really ours anymore. They, they belong to some something else. And then the poor 49ers. Oh, 49ers. Okay, look, look, look we'll, we'll talk about that. All that's coming up. But this is our, our you know, put in a little plug. Hey, Venmo, Emil Dash Guillermo. If you want to, you know, contribute, sponsor what we do here. Because we, we do this out of the goodness of our heart. I know. Is that, is that what, what's good about it? No, no, no. Uh, but to share stories that don't ordinarily get the attention they deserve. Like, you're not going to hear this story that I'm going to read now, which is the National Book Awards, the finalists. For the, now, I won an American Book Award, which is put out by the Before Columbus Foundation. This is the... This is the big one, the National Book Awards. And there's some good good people, Asian Americans. Grace M. Cho, she cooks her grandmother's recipes in Taste Like War, a memoir, exploring her mother's illness and how war, colonial, colonialism, and xenophobia live on in her body. And uh, that's fascinating. That, that was nominated. Uh, others uh, covered with night story of murder and and indigenous justice in early America by Nicole Eustace examines uh, a 1722 murder of an indigenous hunter. A little devil in America notes and praise of black performance. Poet Hanif Abdurakib Abdurik. Abdurakib Hanif. Look, I've just named off four finalists. They're 25. And look how diverse it is. I mean, th that's something. Some others. Um, 
Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. Joined in the fiction category by two others, Anthony Doerr for Cloud Cuckoo Land and Lauren Groff for Matrix. Bewilderment, Bewilderment by Richard Powers. Love Songs of W.E.B. Dubois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. In the poetry category, Martin Espada talks about uh, those who drowned in the Rio Grande in his book Floaters. What Noise Against the Cane, Desiree C. Bailey explores the Haitian re re Revolution, what it means to be a black woman in the United States today. Have you noticed a trend just in the ones that I've read? It's like diversity. They're looking for our stories. They're looking for stories that are not white. In translated literature, Benjamin Labatut's uh, book, When We Cease to Understand the World, among the finalists, uh, also included Planet of Clay by Samir Yazbek, translated from the Arabic by Larry Price, follows a girl named Rima during the Syrian Civil War. There's The Legend of Antipo, a graphic novel, novel by Xing Yin Kor, finalist for Young People's Literature. It reimagines the story of Paul Bunyan against the backdrop of race and immigration in the period following the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Now, look, that is an imaginative theme, The Legend of Antipo by Xing Yin Kor. There's also Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People, also a finalist. Uh, two Lifetime Achievement Awards presented to the writer and professor Karen Tai Yamashita, the author and librarian Nancy Pearl. So look, a ton of really Asian Americans are in here in poetry. Jackie Wong, The Sunflower, Cast a Spell to Save Us from the Void. Hua Nguyen, A Thousand Times You Lose Your Tre Treasure. So I think it's an exciting time to be a writer. It's an exciting time to be an Asian American writer with stories that haven't been told. And if you're like me and have waited, time to, time to get going because there's young people and young stories that are not usurping the story of the elders, but there is a generational thing. And, Here's the thing, everyone seems to be looking for the next young thing. Not the next old thing that looks young, like the old guy with dimples. Not a cool thing, not a, not, a, not a, could be cooler. I'm just saying now's the time. And I say this to all the different generations of Asian American Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiians. The time for our stories is now. So before we get to our basic program, because, you know, 2 p.m. Pacific, and this is the Lanyap section, the what's the something extra. They sold the darn lottery ticket. The Powerball jackpot was sold in Morro Bay. And the jackpot on Monday was $699.8 million. God, I don't get out of bed for anything less than $700 million. What's going on? All right, like, I, I might make an exception here. Can you imagine if I bought $699 million worth of lottery tickets because I wanted to win? And what if you, you just happen to have like all the tickets except the winning one, all right? Because the winning one was sold in Morro Bay. Uh, wh where again, Emil, is Morro Bay? Morro Bay is a coastal city, which is described as not quite San Luis Obispo, keep going, not quite Santa Barbara. Sorry, not that good. It's north of Santa Barbara, south of 
Pismo or San Luis Abismo. I get lost. I don't know where Pismo is in that equation. But Morro Bay is described as halfway between L.A. and San Francisco. Okay, Central Coast. Central Coast. This is where the Filipinos first landed in 1587. October 18, 1587. And that's why... That's why October is Filipino American History Month. Yeah, I mean, I, there are other reasons too. I mean, my birthday month. Okay. Oh, but it's also Larry Itleong's birthday. It's also Rob Bonta's mother's birthday. Rob Bonta, the first Filipino American Attorney General of California. I like that guy. You know, and I, I've met, I've met him. I've met his mom. His mom was a little cool to me. But, uh, you know, she was, she was busy, but October, it's our history month. And what an omen that a lottery ticket worth $699.8 million was sold in Morro Bay, the first landing of Filipinos. Now, I have to explain the story why we aren't called... The United States of the Philippines, as we should, but it's because the Filipinos, they were the first to step foot in America, but they were deckhands. Uh, they were the help. And I mean, if you want to honor the colonial, well, then, yeah, they, they, they claim it for Spain because they were on the boat of Pedro de Unamuno. And he was sailing for Spain. But if you say, heck with the colonizer, I spit on the colonizer, then honor the, the people whose feet are right here on American soil first. Filipinos, Morro Bay, October 18th, 1587. I mean, we're still a couple or a few days away from October 18th. And I'm speaking to you on the October 5th, this being show 151. But when I saw Morro Bay, they sold the winning lottery ticket for $698.8 million at an Albertsons, which I think is sometimes called Lucky, right? Remember? Lucky? That was Lucky! For some, I hope it was a Filipino. It doesn't have to be. But I hope it was. It'd be good. It'd be good if it were. Because then that would really make the analogy historical. But whoever it was, that's fine. Moro Bay. And, of course, if you go to my column that I wrote in 2017... If you go to the ALDEF blog now, I link to it. ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I I link to that column where they have a, a plaque on a rock that says, this is it. This is where they came. And don't you know that rock is now worth its weight in history? Not... 699 million, but uh, worth its weight in history. All right, here we are. That's a little beyond two o'clock, but that's all right. This is a, a Mila Mux takeout. We're live, we're streaming live because it's dangerous that way. This is show number 151. We've done 151 of these things. Got it, Mila. Don't you have anything better to do? This is something better to do. You ought to see what I was doing instead of this. Show number 151. Subtitled, What Does an Asian American Think? What that? What does an Asian American think? W-D-A-A-T. Uh, we fill the void. We, we talked a little about Filipino American history. It's important. I know we dovetail with Spanish 
or Hispanic Heritage Month. And it's, I don't know if that's by design. Hispanic Heritage Month is from September 15th to October 15th. I know it's kind of like they split the months. They straddle the two months. And the Filipinos come in on October 1st and it's like, well, I guess it makes sense because my last name is Guillermo, but I don't say Guillermo. I say Guillermo because that's the way the Filipinos say it. So we're perfect for this confluence of heritage, Hispanic heritage, and the Asian American part, the Filipino part, which is Filipino American history. History, not heritage. It's significant because history incorporates all. It's like the big umbrella. Heritage is just like, oh, well, the things we inherit. Except stories. We don't always inherit our stories. Sometimes our stories we want to forget. We want to forget the stories. But here we try to remember them. So, uh, we do a new scan. What do you think about Facebook? You know, a friend of mine, Charita, she put something down on Facebook. And she said, she said, you know, what do we do with Facebook now? What, what do we, I mean, Facebook crapped out on us yesterday. And... Did it strand you? I mean, I do this show on Facebook. I mean, I distribute it to emilgaliermo.media and to my Emil Guillermo page. But I, I also do it on YouTube, YouTube Live, on the Emil Guillermo channel. So if you were savvy and said, oh, Facebook is down. But if you were smart, you say, oh, well, let's just go to YouTube. We'll find a meal there. I'm sure we'll just like, Start sniffing out the vegan patis. There, there is a vegan patis. I think I'll, I'll find it. I'm not using regular patis. Fishless fish sauce. But there I was. I did the show uh, on on YouTube, and then I, I put it out in Milamuk, not live. But if you were seriously doing a business. I mean, Facebook reaches 3.5 billion people. There, there must have been some companies that lost some money yesterday. Do you think it was like for real? Do you think it was like Facebook, which is under, under the gun for, for antitrust laws, under the gun by the, from this whistleblower in Congress? Do you think maybe Facebook was trying to like just shake us up and say, hey, look, you hate us, but you don't hate us as much. I mean, you'll love us more. Well, we just disappear for like eight hours and you start cursing everyone for, well, where's Facebook? Which may be the case, but I think that's, that's a bad move. First of all, I don't think Facebook would do anything that suicidal. I think this is a significant, a, and, and uh, I, I think someone screwed up. I think someone's got to check the employee roster and see whose name has been left off. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg's name is still in there, but someone screwed up because this would not be the time to draw people's attention to Facebook and how much in trouble they are in. So, uh, but my friend Charita was suggesting, what do you do with Facebook now? And my suggestion was maybe instead of regulation, because no one wants regulation, I think, but maybe we need like a, a citizen oversight, I mean, a real citizen oversight committee, maybe over all of them, because who is Facebook ultimately responsible to? Not to the United States, not to any, I mean, because it's global. Facebook is, by virtue of being a corporate entity, responsible to its shareholders. And that's it. 
And that's why everything that the whistleblower said today is, I mean, I, I like the whistle, what the whistleblower said. I think what the whistleblower said was important. But the fact is, Facebook was doing whatever a corporate entity is allowed to do, which is make astronomical profits, which is what Frances Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower, the phrase she used, saying the company prioritized astronomical profits over the well-being of its users. Well, guess what? Corporate America, that's its goal. Corporate America's goal is not to be nice to people. Corporate America's goal is not to be the best thing for all people in society. Corporate America. And when I worked for a share, or when I worked for a tech company, it was pretty damn clear what was important to them. Two words. Shareholder value. And they get you hooked on it because you're working for them. <laughs> and you and you want your stock, you want your stock options. Not for not me, but when I was working for a tech company that failed. And believe me, I did not become rich. I had the opposite. I had reverse stock options or negative stock options. But really, that first time I ever heard of shareholder value as a thing. And that is what these startups that grow big, like Facebook, end up being. They end up being beholden solely, solely to, to the, the shareholders, solely, solely for those astronomical profits. And if you want to make a company more honest in terms of the, the people, in terms of society, well, then, you know, it's got to be a nonprofit. It's got to be something else. It's got to be a different kind of entity. And that's why I, I was happy to see Frances Haugen out there. To, we need whistleblowers like her because it, it jolts us into a sense of what is this thing? You know, I'm here on Facebook now on some Facebook pages, Emil Media, my Facebook page. I'm on Emil Amuck. And, and the thing is, I use it, you know, for distribution. So people will say, oh, yeah, we're on Facebook and this is where we'll find a meal. But I'd rather be with a company that does good rather than a company that screws up, a company that doesn't care, a company that has no values, moral or otherwise. It seems like they in those Wall Street Journal articles that have been appearing the last month, and we've talked about them on this show throughout, throughout the time that they've been published. You know how Facebook has like preferred groups of people that they coddle, the white list. How Facebook ends up being used by terrorists and by, by you know, traffickers, drug dealers, and they don't do anything about it. And what, and, and then, you know, we, we haven't begun to talk about January 6th and how Facebook pretty much fanned the flames, getting out the word to people who are out there on January 6th at the Capitol. The idea that the algorithm foments hate, violence, division. What do we do about that? How do we regulate this thing that may be beyond regulation? You know, I heard some, some, uh, a journalist opinionist. I, I, I'm really a journalist and opinionist, a, an analyst commentator, because I'll serve up news and opinion. But there was one guy who said, I heard him today say, you know, Facebook ought to be, you know, if you, if you tell lies, you should be taken off. If you, don't say the truth. You should be taking I mean, Facebook should be responsible and the people who are putting out these lies should be responsible. 
and I, I, on the one hand, I agree, this shouldn't be for lies. But now who's going to determine that? Who's going to determine what's truth? Now we get into free speech, and now we get into a kind of regulation that the Constitution says, hey, we allow that in our, you know, in, well, first of all, the First Amendment would not apply to Facebook because it's a private concern. But the principle, the principle is strong enough so that if we were strong enough in our values and our beliefs, we'd say, hey, look, we believe in the First Amendment and we believe in protecting that right. But let's find a way so that we can have the truth and we can have freedom to express ourselves in something, social media, Facebook, something like this. I mean, that's where we are right now. How do we impose these values on a private concern? I said, maybe we do this citizen watchdog group. I mean, why, why isn't it that more internet companies have this sense of responsibility? Because you just don't see it. I mean, it really is. Tech companies, to me, are always a group of mostly guys, but now women, in, from a garage mentality, right? Startup. So it's kind of begins with this siege mentality, us versus them. And they, all they're interested in is for their technology to make money. Are they interested in customer service? No. Are they interested in consumer? No. Are they interested in labor rights? No. They'll work themselves to death 24 hours if they can become millionaires in the first 12 months. They'll make the sacrifice. But at some point, you have to consider other people like i always hate it when a, a tech company becomes so big they don't have decent customer service try to get a call into you name it x you name the big tech company i mean amazon has gotten a little better about customer service but try to get a hold of google try to get a hold of facebook it's almost impossible uh, everything is DIY or Zendesk or I I wrote to a company today an email and usually you get the do not reply emails. They say don't even reply to this email and then you got to hunt down how to find out how to communicate with them. I got one email back from a company that says we'll, we'll respond in 72 hours. Yeah, everything is instantaneous except the response to a consumer concern. So, look, I think we are into a new era with these companies where we, we have to do something. We have to do something. Now, they were speaking before the Senate Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. That's probably where all this should begin. And let's just hope this is hope we can get it right because, you know, an, an internet generation is like four years and people are getting hurt. I mean, you heard the testimony about teenage girls, young people, bullying, eating disorders, the algorithm, the divide, the racial divides that exist because of the algorithm that fan the flames and allows you to see just how strange your best friends are and how you didn't really know what they were all about until you saw that anti-vax tweet. So I just think that we got senators like uh, Klobuchar, Ed Markey. We got even Ted Cruz saying they'd support subpoenaing uh, internal documents for further hearings. You know, Hagen said Facebook would still be profitable if it changed its algorithms and didn't do all the nasty stuff that it, it does. Or 
it, it, it tries to say that they are equanimous to all the nasty stuff it does or the nasty results. They just say, hey, it's the algorithm's fault. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Someone's got to take responsibility. Someone's got to take responsibility for all those teenage girls who are thinking about suicide. Are all the other teenagers, and not just girls, but eating disorders, suicide ideation among teenage girls and mental health, that, that's come up. Raised by Francis Hogan, the, uh, the whistleblower. But imagine that. Hogan said Facebook would still be profitable, but of course, if shareholder value is your only marker, well, why stop at 100 million when you can have 800 million? Or why stop at 3 billion when you can have 10 billion? And at that point, that's when we, the people, have to get serious about regulation. So what's it going to be? I, I think a citizen panel, a national citizen panel, not among techies, not about, you know, with people, users, or people who, know, I mean, we need something like an FCC, although this is like 22nd century FCC. Because, man, the F and the FCC is so political. That's the other thing. All this stuff ends up being political. So you got problems on the corporate side, problems on the political side. Facebook can help itself by forming these panels, by forming. Look, it's a big, a big, big outfit. It's not a, a little teeny outfit in a garage dealing with people, you know, around the world. It's. It's a big corporation now. It's got to figure out how to build a public infrastructure that can regulate itself without outsourcing the regulation to the third world, to people who are looking at all these strange videos that, that are posted and that no one understands. I mean, if you're in a third world country and you're watching something posted in America, how do they know what's going on? I don't like the way Facebook does things. All uh, right, right now. But you know, when you when you're saying uh, this is the only game in town, then you know that's bad. That's a monopoly. That's what we fight against, right? So. I, I'm, I'm thinking about Facebook, but check out the show on uh, YouTube, on the Emil Guillermo channel, just in case. I'm just passing it on. And sometimes we post it on Twitter. I saw Biden a lot today, President Biden out there pumping that social spending bill. And it looks like Biden and the progressive Democrats are coming closer. Look, here's the thing. American people are American people, and we need child care, education, climate change, health care. We need all those things. And $3.5 trillion, uh, you know, to say, oh, well, we're going to trim it down to $2.9 trillion or $2.5. Who can Look, we're talking about the American people. $3.5 trillion is nothing. And if you save two point, if you save, if you go down two point five trillion, you save a little bit. Who cares? Donald Trump, when he cut the taxes on the rich and raised the the national debt to two hundred eighty seven something trillion, look, it's all play money to these guys. But the analogy to your home budget is not right. Fortunately, our budget is a little bigger for the country than our own personal budgets. So only take that analogy so far and then understand that sometimes you have to pay to be inclusive 
to get the thing or the things we need as a country. I mean, remember, the original goal was not even $3 trillion. It was like $6 trillion to make sure that all of us have something to fall on, you know, a social safety net. You know, and then, of course, that's on top of the real physical infrastructure so that we have something to drive on. So we have, you know, clean water. We have an environment that we're protecting that we, you know, we have, I'm so, okay, I wouldn't even mention it. Because, you know, people who listen to the show know that I live in an area where the digital divide is real. We need everyone included on broadband. Otherwise, you want to see how feeling left out is? So, uh, for an Asian American perspective, thank goodness for people like uh, Pramila Jayapal, representative from uh, Seattle or from Washington. She's out there. When you see her, she's an Asian American woman. She's standing there for us. For all of us, not just Asian Americans. She happens to be Asian American. That's good. Let's see. Some other things in the, the news. Sports. You know, I I don't talk about sports really a whole lot because, look, it's one of my addictions. Did you see the Raiders play last night? Man, they looked like crap. I'm, gl I'm glad I had season tickets 20 years ago and not now. But my goodness, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't understand the Raiders. They belong to someone else now. So, and, uh, and the 49ers, all right, this is how far back I go with the 49ers. Kizar Stadium. There I be. Underneath. Underneath the... The seats, I mean, they're wooden seats. And you could see, like, the the slats for where people put their feet and where people put their butts, and you're underneath the bleachers. And you're like, you can look up. And, and when the game was really boring, because sometimes the game was, I mean, it was the 19s and the 49ers of the 60s. It didn't cost us anything as kids, because we buy Christopher Milk, right, in the carts. Christopher Milk owned by uh, George Christopher, the former mayor of San Francisco. He owned a, a milk thing. And we would buy the milk and dump it out in the sewer because it was like lousy milk. It, wa it wasn't good milk. See, I was kind of vegan before vegan was in. And they we dumped it out because there was a coupon on the carton. Before they put missing kids on milk cartons, they put missing football teams. They say, hey, this is a lousy football team, but here, Take this carton coupon and go to the game for free, you Christopher Milk person. And later on, it was Berkeley Farms. But that's how we went to Kizar. And the 49ers were bad. Bad, bad, bad. And, uh, but then when they got good, right, with Monday, it was like a revelation. I, I don't have that feeling this year about whether or not they're going to be good. I, they're, they're just going to be, they're just going to be okay. Because Jimmy Garoppolo is hurt and he was lousy to begin with. Trey Lance, maybe he starts picking up and we start getting hope like toward the end of the season. But my fingers are crossed for Trey Lance. I mean, I think he has the potential to make it ultimately. If not this year, then next but he's only played so many football games. I mean, he, you know, went to some college where they, he didn't play that much, but he was good. I'm glad they have him though, because he's the kind of quarterback the 49ers ultimately need. All right. So football and eh, baseball, and this is a time for baseball. Uh, I'm still a big giants fan. I feel really good about the Giants. Everyone is recognizing them now for being the kind of good team that they are. But 
I don't think their pitching is as good. Their bullpen is good, but their starting pitching. If Johnny Cueto has an, an, an amazing postseason, is if he's back from injury because he was out last couple of weeks, if he has a good final push, if Logan Webb showed that, yeah, he hit that home run on the last day, he looks like he's good. Gosman, oh, my God. I love Gosman, but Gosman, Kevin Gosman, is erratic as hell. And uh, gone are the days of Bumgarner when he was good, Matt Cain, and Tim Linscombe. Those are three pitchers that you can send out and say, I'll match you ace for ace. The Giants can't do that on paper with very many teams. But, right, team is team. Together, right, we achieve more, I think is the acronym. So, darn it, 107 wins, all the more home runs than the Willie Mays years, than the Bobby Bonds years. Orange and black. I don't have any orange and black things here in my gong, but I'm. I and I, I, would like to see them play the Cardinals, because the Cardinals are weaker than the Dodgers ultimately. But you know, if it's the Dodgers, bring them on. Let's kick the Dodgers' butts, and it'll be interesting for all us California Asian Americans, who are baseball fans. All right, that's it for. Oh, one, one last sports thing. I was watching television last night. The Warriors were on. I thought, oh, this is like a game. Why are they showing games from like three years ago? I thought it was like an old game they were playing. Because I, I, it just had that old, dark, you know, like not real life or not current. And those were the current Warriors. It was a preseason game. And they looked like they were in midseason form. And I said to myself... Oh, my God. Jordan Poole actually can play. I mean, after, like, disappointing us all those, you know, early years when he first got into the league, when he wore his glasses and his hair front, he's a good player. And the Warriors look like they are ready to contend. So, uh, Warrior fans, and I know there are Filipino Warrior fans out there. I know there are Asian American Warrior fans. Out there. They look good. Preseason. I think first game, right? They look good. And Clay Thompson isn't even back yet. Even Draymond looks good. He was making shots. For goodness sakes. Draymond and Igadala's back. Oh, it, it's going to be a good year for Warrior fans. Okay. Where are we now? Oh. A couple things, uh, a couple news things to mention. After 12 years of running the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, stepping down. Thank goodness, Dr. Francis Collins. It's a he doctor, not a she doctor. Dr. Francis Collins has been responsible for holding up the progress of a modern way of doing science at the premier scientific organization in America. And now that he's stepping down, thank goodness. Thank goodness we don't have to wonder or endure more years of Francis Collins at the helm. He says, he believes it's time for new leadership to lead the NIH into the future. Well, it's good because Francis Collins was going backwards. All you have to do is read the Washington Post investigative report on gain-of-function research that pretty much was controlled by Collins and Fauci in a totally autocratic way. And potentially hazardous to the public because gain of function means to really juice up a virus and make it 
even more viral to see what it would do, not really being in control of, you know, what happens to it. So, and there was no recourse. I mean, it was the buck stopped with Collins and Fauci, and they pretty much kept it secret until the Washington Post did their big gain-of-function investigation about a month ago. But check it out. There's a lot of pressure on Collins to go back and live out his days because his days are are not in tune with the times or his vision of science is become born again, which means, oh, I don't know. Well, what are his thoughts on evolution if he's a born again? Uh, just because you play guitar and ride a Harley doesn't make you a good guy. So Francis Collins leaving NIH. I mentioned that because as you know, I host the PETA podcast and the PETA podcast has been talking about the need to replace Francis Collins. And now here is the time. This will open up science, make it less cruel, make it more effective, may open up to modernization of the research practices. It's a good day that Dr. Francis Collins has self-aborted as the director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I do want to mention, we, we started talking about one whistleblower, Francis Hagen, the Facebook whistleblower. I do want to mention, tomorrow on the PETA podcast, I have an interview, not with Francis Hagen, but another whistleblower, Dr. Lisa Jones Engel, who is the star source of a big piece that's in USA Today, the USA Today Network, and the Arizona Republic. You can go online, check it out, talking about the Washington National Primate Research Center and how they leased a facility in Mesa, Arizona, that was in violation of state and federal laws, killed numerous monkeys, and existed as a, pa as a public hazard to the people in that Arizona community, as well as a hazard to the people who live near Washington, where the Washington National Primate Research, Research Center is. And everywhere were these sick monkeys because they were developing sick monkeys to use as test media were sent off for research. Anyway, check that out. I talked to Dr. Lisa Jones Engel on the PETA podcast releasing tomorrow. Uh, one last thing I want to share with you. And that is, do I have one last thing? I, I think that's it. I think that's it, Emil. Darn it. I, that is it. So I, I have this contemplative music coming because I I find that it calms me down. Because part of this is for me to think about the news, right? Oh, yeah, we're going to do the news scan. You know, scan the news. News is bad. And you, you want to jump at it, but part of it is to maybe pause and be somewhat equanimous and think about what can we do? What can do? What can we do better? So I'm just looking at the, uh, the news. It's all New York Times, all Facebook. Someone sent me a thing saying, hey, uh, it was a meme. Now that Facebook was down, are you happier? Or it said, uh, Facebook's down. America was happy. I know, were we happy? I guess my, my involvement with Facebook is somewhat limited, only as, you know, in, in terms of doing this program. 
but I suppose I just went off to, to Twitter, went off to YouTube. Another friend said, now that Facebook was down, did you talk to anybody? What did you say to your friends? And, and I have to admit that I... I guess I depend on all the digital stuff now during the pandemic and that this is the way I communicate with everyone out there, whether they want it or not. Incidentally, <laughs> you can't stop me. So I don't know. I, I didn't speak to anyone in person except my wife. I've been speaking to her in person for the last 30 some years. So I'll leave you with this. I told a story at this Harvard alumni thing, and I'll tell you how to, how to access the story and see the power of coalitions. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Oh, I get to see my my I get to see my meditation teacher tomorrow, or at least have a phone call with him tomorrow. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, this music is is here for a purpose because if you've lasted this long, you know, the true lanyap is not at the beginning; it's at the end. It's at the end where you know you've traveled this way with me. And I thank you for joining me. And I tell you that, hey, you're good enough. You're worthy. Give yourself a hug. Don't feel shame. You know, I, and as a kid, I, I used to always crick my neck like this. Like, uh, like I was somehow ashamed. Don't be ashamed. And if you're Filipino, especially if you're Filipino, don't be ashamed. This month, this is Filipino American National History Month. Or just Filipino American History Month. Under the auspices of the Filipino American National Historical Society. But this is it. Feel good. Feel good. Walk through that door of shame toward the door of love. It's all about love. self-love in the good way that's where it begins that's where you show it first so thank you for being here join me tomorrow follow me on twitter at emil amok go to amok.com for replays and notes and that kind of thing oh yeah you you can check it out too at emilgalermo.media on Facebook. But amok.com is kind of home base. Off the reservation, the Facebook reservation. We're there at amok.com. Email me there, emil, E-M-I-L, at amok.com. This is the Micro Talk Show of the AAPI, the AAX, and the ALL. Oh, the micro talk show of all? Oh, yeah, all. Oh. Emil Guillermo here. As I'm fond of saying, may you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you live with ease. Till next time. Mahal. Gita.